Hello and welcome to our webinar. This is professional real estate investor David Campbell and today's presentation is Cash Management Strategies for Real Estate Investors. Joining me on today's presentation is a friend, a financial strategist and economist and a great mentor to many, Patrick Donahoe. Hey David, thanks, uh, thanks for having me on tonight. This is going to be very exciting. I love doing these events because of how much I learn. And I've heard Patrick speak on many occasions, and I have learned a ton. So let's get started. A little bit about myself. I started life as a high school band director, realized that was not a great way to make money, discovered real estate, investing, became a, a developer, a real estate broker, uh, was very fortunate that I became a multimillionaire uh, through the vehicle of real estate investing, really starting with no assets to speak with, except for one asset, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, and then I had the great fortune of being on the faculty of the Summit at Sea with uh, Robert and Kim Kiyosaki and some other prestigious guests, including uh, Patrick Donahoe. And that's where Patrick and I met a couple years ago. And we've been on the faculty of that event for a couple years, and I've been really intrigued by the uh, infinite banking concept and using um, different strategies for cash management. So, Patrick, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and Paradigm Life? Uh, sure. I, I guess the best way to uh, to start is how I, I came to find the Real Estate Guys, which is where we met David. Uh, we've we've been advertising with them for uh, I think it's a little over a little over four years now, almost almost five years. And through a, a, a mutual uh, friend of ours is how I came to know their their podcast and their real estate uh, radio show. Uh, so that that's that's how I got to, uh, to to know them and was invited to go on the the summit at sea a couple of years ago. Uh, but I started I started doing this. Uh, and I did, by no means did I invent uh, the infinite banking concept or what we do here at Paradigm Life. Uh, I think I've I've uh, kind of massaged it and made it. Uh, a uh, little bit more uh, attractive and, and added some things to it, but it was originally created by a man named Nelson Nash uh, a little over 30 years ago. And so I basically adopted a system that he had been using uh, and it worked for several decades. And so um, so that, that's kind of my background. I learned about it about, uh, about five years ago and uh, decided to break away from a business partnership I had at the time and uh, took that database as part of the split and was able to do quite a bit of internet marketing and I have a guy here in my office, Dan, who is amazing. He's a whiz on the internet, and so we've been able to attract a lot of business over uh, uh, over the last five years throughout the entire country. We've actually done business in in all 50 states. And uh, like I said, we teach a very unique concept uh, called the infinite banking concept. A lot of people have not heard of it. Uh, it has become more popular recently just because of the downturn in the economy. People are looking for alternative strategies, better places to put their money. Uh, we we live in a very cash uh, society right now where people are not uh, getting into debt, they're in fact paying off debt, getting into less risky investments, not willing to take the risks that they took previous to 2008 uh, because they don't want to, you know, obviously bear the burden that uh, that chaos and, and downturn caused. So it, it's been a, a great couple of years. Um, this this system has uh, changed my life, uh, and we have uh, hundreds, over a thousand clients that has changed their lives as well. And so it's uh, it's exciting to be able to share this with uh, with you guys tonight. I am excited too. Before we get into the meat of today's presentation, it's just an important disclaimer. Uh, neither Patrick and I are engaged in providing legal tax or investment advice. Even though we both work in the fields of investments, we have not created an agency or fiduciary relationship as a result of this presentation. And this event is entirely educational only, and there's no guarantee of accuracy that what we're saying is uh, true or accurate or even makes sense. You know, it's really up for you to just take the information in. And if you think it is something that makes sense to you, you can engage the appropriate professional um, and, and work with that professional and putting together your own investment uh, strategy, your own investment plan together. And uh, if you want to engage Kat, Patrick or I offline, that's something that we could absolutely talk about. So let's move on. So when I first heard Patrick, uh, here's Patrick over here, uh, and he looks sharp in his suit, and there's me in the middle over there, and uh, here's some uh, rich dad advisors. Ken McElroy is a, a great mentor of mine, 
and uh, I read his his book, uh, ABCs of Real Estate Investing. I bought that at Barnes and Noble, and you know, probably twelve years ago, and that was one of the catalysts that really got me started into real estate investing. And then, what a great honor to be on on the stage teaching uh, on a panel um, with Ken. So when I first heard Patrick talk, his talk was about cash management strategies and infinite banking. And I thought I was going to hear a presentation about starting my own bank. And I was super excited. I am going to start my own bank. And then about the third word out of his mouth was life insurance. And I felt so screwed. I thought, no way. You are lying to me that I get to start my own bank. This is about life insurance. This is a joke. What do I, what do I need life insurance, right? Or maybe I need term insurance, but this cash value insurance or permanent insurance, it didn't make any sense to me. And I actually sat with that feeling for about a year. And then <laughs> I saw, and I, but I was really impressed with Patrick because he was clearly smart. He was an economist. And every time he talked about economics, I was just, yeah, yeah, right on. I totally get what you're saying. And uh, an Austrian school of thought, and that really resonated with me. And yeah, okay, I really get this. You're a smart guy, but permanent life insurance, cash value life insurance, how does that relate to me as a real estate investor at all? I didn't get it. And I consider myself a pretty smart guy and a savvy investor. And it took a year for that concept to sink in. And because you know, I developed a friendship with Patrick. I just out of courtesy, I went to hear him speak a second time and then I got it. And what I realized is I had been using the infinite banking concept all along and I didn't know it. I just didn't have a name for it. Right? I was just using uh, a cash value life insurance policy that my dad had bought for me when I was a kid. And it became a paid up policy over 20 years. And I actually used the a loan against that cash value policy to buy my first property with. And then once I had a little bit of money saved up, I, I paid off that loan. And lo and behold, that's how simple the infinite banking concept is. And I'm so grateful to my dad who bought that policy for me when I was probably seven or eight years old and it built up enough cash value that even though I you know, was basically broke and all I had to my name was a, a paycheck teaching high school band and this cash policy, I was able to get that liquidity I needed for a down payment. That first property uh, really was the beginning of a multi-million dollar uh, success story in real estate. And so I'm really happy that I took the chance to really open my mind to a new paradigm. And that's a little bit, you know, kind of trite, you know, par paradigm life, but it is really true. And now I'm a very proud paradigm life customer. Uh, I really get the concept. I'm using it. I started a whole life policy uh, for my kids and, you know, really working with Patrick, understanding how to use cash value insurance and term insurance to really make uh, sense out of my cash management strategy, also as a risk mitigation tool. And you're going to learn a lot in today's presentation that was really new to me. I didn't really understand how powerful insurance could be. And uh, I'm really excited about what we're going to learn in the next hour. But before we get started, just really want you to take this poll so we get a feeling for who's on the call today, what kind of information that you uh, are starting with. So if you could just take a moment, click on the screen. What is your level of uh, familiarity with the infinite banking concept? And in just a moment, we are going to close the poll. And uh, how familiar are you with the infinite banking concept? Are you a newbie? Do you know a little bit? Or are you a pro? Let's find out. So we have about half our audience today um, are already new, to, I mean, already uh, using the, the concept, which is great. And we're going to dig in deep for you and find some good information. And then uh, about half 
are, are kind of in the exploratory mode. So let's dig in. Patrick, can you make the infinite banking concept or cash management using uh, life insurance make it as simple as possible for me to understand? Well, you, you go back to some of the things you were just saying, uh, David. I think that's that's probably where where I should start. Um, I you look at what makes something valuable, and it's really not in, intrinsic in the thing itself. It's how it's used. Um, you just because you own a piece of real estate doesn't mean that the real estate is productive. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of lemons out there, and I think the seasoned real estate investors. They, they realize that and recognize that and it's the same thing with any any other thing something can be used for good something can be used for bad um, you know Warren Buffett can take a business and turn it upside and down and make it much more profitable uh, than you could and it has nothing to do necessarily with the business but the expertise of the individual that takes on the business and, and uses it builds it up sells it etc so the insurance is the same thing most people buy insurance for for protection and the best insurance for protection is term insurance and that's why it's uh, it's the most it's purchased the most often uh, much more than than permanent insurance. But I think the first thing that really intrigued me was a book I read uh, called the the Pirates of Manhattan, and it's also by an economist. He's up in uh, up in New Hampshire. He's written another book since, but he he basically wrote a book about what we do about permanent insurance. But what he did is he he made a correlation with how banks and corporations use it, and so funny enough. The uh, the biggest business or the biggest businesses and the biggest banks in our country are the biggest purchasers of life insurance, but they're not buying term insurance. They're buying insurance for for cash value. So you can go on to uh, the, the corporate records, whether it's the quarterly earnings report uh, or just you know annual statement. You could look at corporations and how much insurance they own. Same thing with banks. You can go into FDIC's webpage and look at how much uh, cash value they have on policies they own on their employees. Uh, believe believe it or not. And so once I read that, I said, you know, it, obviously the, the stigma of insurance uh, left because I realized that here the biggest corporations and, and banks in our country and, and in the world are utilizing <clears throat> a type of insurance policy that is, that is shunned by every other major uh, financial, you know, self-proclaimed guru. And, and that's what really started to intrigue me. So I think, you know, as it relates to your, your initial question, what's the simple way of defining uh, the infinite banking concept? It's you know basically to, to set insurance up in a very unique way, similar to how banks and corporations set it up, not for coverage, but for cash value. And the cash value has financial characteristics that will outperform every other uh, safe account out there. And what really makes the infinite banking concept valuable is that the insurance companies that you set these policies up with will guarantee you a loan against your account. And that loan can be used for anything under the sun. Just like you used it to purchase a piece of real estate, uh, I could spend 30 minutes listing off the things that our clients have used the, the policy loan for. But the unique part of it is that even though you are taking this policy loan from the insurance company, the cash value continues to grow and earn interest as if you never touched it because you didn't. The loan is coming from the insurance company. In, so I, I guess that's probably the best way to do it. And there's obviously much more to that, but in in uh, very simplistic terms, that's that's uh, that's probably the best way to explain it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was really want to underscore what you said earlier, it's how you use something makes it valuable, right? So when you're looking at what life insurance is and uh, the kind of the difference between you know how you would use a term policy and how you would use a cash value policy, for example, in a, uh, my development company. Uh, you know, I take out a lot of loans to build uh, commercial buildings or to build houses. And when I take out a loan to build uh, houses, my lender oftentimes will require me to have a million or $2 million life insurance policy against my life. Because if I died, then the development project might not get finished and the, the lender might get, wants to get paid off, right? So it's kind of key man, a form of key man insurance. And that's a great way to use term insurance. But with cash value insurance, it's just a different tool and you use that type of insurance differently. So just kind of making it simple, cash value life insurance is a policy owner, right? So I own the policy, that's an asset, and I pay premiums to the life insurance company. The life insurance company takes that money in and then they invest that premium for profit. Life insurance companies make loans, they buy uh, 
different investments, including real estate and other uh, investments that a, a, a prudent investor would do. Basically, an insurance life insurance company takes your money and they invest it, similar to how you would invest it, but they do it on a very large scale. Then they take those profits and then they share them with all the policy owners. So it's kind of like a, a credit union where you have membership in the credit union and then all of the uh, policy owners get a dividend credited towards their account based on how successful the life insurance company was at investing that money. So let me, let me step in, David, for a second. I mean, and maybe explain a couple of these couple of these points. Uh, you you had alluded to the the Austrian school of, of economics, which I you know I like economists that are that are not necessarily from the Austrian school, uh, but I think they've become very popular because of Ron Paul uh, and also because of the the the, the plight of the Keynesian school uh, theory, which which hasn't really worked, and the Austrian school is kind of the uh, the the opposite of that, um, but. Uh, the, the fundamentals of the Austrian School of Economics uh, is is basically private contract, and if you look at uh, contractual law, it's one of the fundamentals of our country. And one of the last financial contracts that is 100% private is a life insurance contract. And and so with with w what you set up, it is it is private between you, a, a sovereign individual, and a, pro a completely private company. And when you purchase from a specific company, it's not all insurance companies, uh, because some insurance, the majority of insurance companies out there are publicly owned, which means they're owned by shareholders and are actively traded on stock exchanges. Uh, but this is much different. It's a, it's a mutual company, and mutual companies have no owners other than policy owners that purchased a specific type of insurance. So I wanted to just kind of go, go off of. Um, some of your points that you've made and, and clarify and, and add to a few things. But another thing as well, uh, just kind of one, one more uh, sub bullet point is insurance companies have, have been around for hundreds of years. They're some of the first financial institutions and the dividends that they pay um, have gone past uh, 100 in years, some even more than 120 years. They've never missed a dividend payment in, in over a decade and there's no other financial institution out there that can proclaim that. Mm -hmm. In some senses, the insurance company uh, functions like a bank, but they don't have the benefits of belonging to uh, the FDIC or uh, belonging to. It's, the it's honestly how a bank should be set up. Um, insurance companies have a 100% reserve requirement, whereas banks only have 10, sometimes less. So, it, it, in a sense, and obviously this could be a whole presentation in and of itself, but insurance companies are really set up uh, how banks really should be set up. Mm -hmm. So one experience that I had young in uh, my career as a teacher, I was paying into STRS, the State Teachers Retirement System, and just a friend of a friend of mine was an executive with uh, California's uh, STRS, and I was having dinner with him, and he basically explained to me that the reason teachers get paid, get a higher retirement for retiring later had nothing to do with rewarding teachers for longevity. I thought, you know, oh man, if I teach for 40 years, think of the <laughs> retirement I'm gonna get versus working for 30 years. And what he explained to me is that he knows statistically, I'm more likely to die younger by teaching for 40 years than if I retire, than if I had taught for 30 years, independent of my age, just the stress of teaching that extra 10 years in life will cause me to die younger. And therefore, if I die, I'm taking less money out of the system. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this had nothing to do with um, retirement and, and just rewarding teachers. This has everything to do with statistics. And that's what life insurance companies are based upon, is they know that most people don't pay their premium until they die. For whatever reason, they pay, they pay, they pay, they stop paying, and then they die. And if you stop paying, you don't get the benefits. And yeah, it's, the statistics, 99%, there's so many studies that are done on this, but 99% of term insurance never ends in a, in a death claim. There's always a lapse in coverage. And permanent insurance which was which is staggering. Ninety percent of permanent insurance is surrendered before maturity. Yeah, and I made that stupid mistake as well because I didn't understand. I hadn't met Patrick yet, 
So I, my dad set up this great cash value policy for me. I borrowed against it and bought my property. I paid it back. I borrowed it again. I bought another property. I paid it back. And then I was flush once with cash. And I said, why, why do I, uh, uh, why am I paying on this life insurance loan? Why don't I just uh, liquidate it and be done? I don't have to make this payment anymore. And that's going to improve my cash flow, so to speak. And now I'm kicking myself and, and saying, how silly, right? That that policy was set up that I could borrow against it. Um, and you'll see why that was silly that I canceled it. And I really wish I, I hadn't. And now I get, get to start over at an older age, right? Insurance is cheaper the younger you are. The healthier you are, the cheaper that insurance is. And I get to now you know, pay premiums as an old man rather than as a, <laughs> as a young one. <laughs> as an eight-year-old, right? That's so... The reason insurance can, companies can pay such huge benefits off such small monthly payments is this legal and statistical pyramid scheme. There's just millions of people paying in for a very small number of people taking benefits out. And that's okay if you just realize that's what it is and that there will always be people paying in and there's always a small number of people taking out. And statistically, it's always been that way. And that's where uh, the insurance company, uh, they use that overage of premium. They use it for their operations. They use it to pay death benefits and they use it to invest. And, and, it, and it transcends to other insurance companies too, not just life insurance. I and mean, that's, you know, the, the, the probability method is with health insurance, car insurance, um, disability insurance, I mean, the list goes on and on. That's just how insurance works. The insurance company takes a huge pool of people and it figures out the probability of claims based on the amount of premiums that are collected. So that's why a lot of insurance companies are very, very profitable. Yeah. And so if you understand um, the premise of insurance, then you can use it for your advantage. And so the main takeaway that I got from working with Patrick is keep paying on your insurance until you die. Because if you're one of those anomalies that make it all the way to the end, it's like buying a guaranteed lottery ticket for your heirs. And it just made a lot of sense for me. Um, so why should you have cash value life insurance? And Patrick and I were going over all the reasons we probably could have gone on for hours on this topic, but just to keep it within our time frame today patrick can you tell us why does cash value in life insurance make sense and how would you use it as a tool well it's one of the it's one of the most liquid places to 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 keep your money and it's like i said it, it's it has the history there that uh that is evident and looking at the lackluster returns that you earn in any type of liquid account today um, you know, earning the the four to five, sometimes higher return that you would on insurance is you know hundreds of percent higher than what's being earned right now, which is you know 0.1, 0 0.2%. So it's a great place to to store capital. Like I said before, it's it's private, and so in most states there's uh, asset protection, which means that it cannot be garnished if you are subject to a lawsuit or a party to a lawsuit. Right, and so that's another uh, good good thing as far as. Uh, uh, insurance, uh, you know, business owners and real estate investors. Uh, the growth is uh, is tax free, so you don't pay any type of income tax, capital gains tax, uh, interest earnings tax on the uh, on the money that's received in interest and and dividends. Uh, and like I said before, the the idea behind borrowing against your money, the co compound interest is claimed to be the eighth wonder of the world, uh, but you have to be in in it for the long run to really take advantage of that compound interest because the compound curve doesn't really work until the end. So you have to be there until the end. So the ability to borrow against your um, borrow against your cash value allows the use of the money without having to liquidate it or with, withdraw it, similar to what similar to what you did. Yeah, let's let's make uh, it really simple. So the thing that when I first heard about cash value insurance, I heard you can make four to five percent returns. And I thought, how silly. As a real estate investor, you know, I'm used to double digit returns. You know, if it's not at least 15, 20% annualized return as a real estate investor, I didn't really know. It's, it's not worth your time. Yeah, exactly. And so when you say I can put my money here and make four to five percent, my novice, uneducated mind shut down and I said, 
four to five percent, uh, not interested. Yep. Uh, when you put it in the perspective of it's not really an investment, it's a savings plan or it's a place to store your liquidity while you're waiting to do the next deal. Or maybe it's a place for your cash reserves uh, to offset a contingent liability, right? Maybe yeah. I can, uh, in lieu of, you know, taking out a CD at 1% just to sit there in case I have a contingent liability that I need to tap into it, I can have this money in a, uh, a life policy that I can draw against. Well, we, we often refer to it as an, as an and asset. And so what that means is it's not it's not an alternative to real estate. It's not an alternative to a, a mutual fund. It's not an alternative to a 401k uh, because it's not just an account. It, it's an account that you can use with, with other types of investments through that loan provision. So if you have a, a real estate investment that's going to pay 20-25%, uh, you have the money inside the insurance that's going to be growing. Now you borrow against it for use with this investment, earning that rate of return. And then because there's interest associated with the policy loan, you have an additional tax deduction. So you actually make out better than if you used cash into this uh, into this 20 to 25% investment. So when I was younger and a little bit more aggressive as an investor, I used to use my credit cards as my contingent reserves. So you know who needs to have savings because I've got a $100,000 credit card line that I can draw upon if I need access to reserves. And that was great until just lo and behold, one day my credit cards got shut down. And yeah, you weren't, you weren't alone. <laughs> so through no fault of mine, I didn't miss a payment. My credit score didn't change the bank or American express rather just decided that you no, know, instead of giving me, a $30,000 credit line, they were going to overnight without warning, drop my credit line to $3,000, which is my existing balance. And then that was a domino because and now I had that line a hundred percent drawn where it used to be, you know, 10% uh, drawn. Now it was a hundred percent drawn. My other credit card companies saw that I'd maxed out a credit card and they cut my limits too. And through no fault of my own, all of my quote unquote liquidity disappeared. And the same thing with a HELOC. I used to keep uh, home equity lines of credit um, against properties as a reserve. You know, if I need more money, I'll just draw on my HELOC. And that made sense to me because uh, having the credit card line didn't cost me anything to keep it open. Having the HELOC didn't cost me anything unless I drew on it. And so once upon a time, I had a, you know, a quarter million dollars of uh, home equity line of credit. I paid it down because I didn't want to pay the high interest rates. And the moment I paid it down, you know where this is going. They shut off the credit line and I couldn't draw it out again. And that was you know, the credit crisis that we all went through. And what I thought was a source of storing liquid capital, a source of reserves, disappeared. And I was uh, not very happy, and, but there's nothing I could do about it. So, Patrick, if I have a cash value life insurance policy, could that happen to me? Well, no, it can't because if you, you look at the, your, your policy contract, David, that, that you have, uh, or look at mine or look at any other uh, the companies that we set up, it's an actual con uh, contractual guarantee that they will uh, loan you money uh, up to the amount of cash value that you have. So they would be violating a contract if they were to if they were to pull it. Um, so and that's that's the beauty behind it because you're you're kind of alluding to one of the parts of the policy because if you envision, you know, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar credit line against your house, now imagine your two hundred fifty thousand dollar credit line having an asset back to it earning, um, you know, four five six percent per year tax free. Yeah. That makes so, sense. yeah, so it's kind of a collateralized line of line of credit, whereas your you know, your your HELOC has has a collateral, but the collateral is not within the control of the bank because the bank can't control property values. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean you you, you can go football, uh, back and forth, but you understand the value as a real estate investor. You understand the value to to access of capital and access of credit, and with novice real estate investors that have 
because because you've and you've probably seen this as well. There have been a lot of, of real estate uh, investors that have sprung up since 2008, uh, 2009. Um, we were talking before, and I I did some research on the amount of foreclosures that are out there, uh, which surpasses 16 million since 2008. So right now there is super low interest rates, and there are uh, properties galore. And so it's it's very easy to get into a property and earn the rates of return that you were talking about just now, 20, 25, I've, I've seen much higher. So you do that, and obviously everything's going great for a year or so, but then the roof goes out, or uh, you, you have to replace the bathroom, or um, you know, some, some other repair is needed. You have a vacancy for two, three months. Access to capital and access to credit is, is huge, and a large part of why real estate investors oftentimes are not able to weather the ebb and flow of, of economies uh, is because of that fact, is because of the access to cash, access, access to credit, because you made it through and you've done great. Um, but how many real estate investors quit because they lost everything in 2008? Mm -hmm. So what's to say the next 2008 is two years down the road? And are you liquid? Do you have uh, an, enough cash? Do you have enough credit to be able to you know, transcend that, that rough period of time? Because all, all real estate investors are going to have that inevitably. Mm -hmm. One thing that you know, in this last uh, market cycle, you know, I was very aggressively invested, and anyone who has been investing for uh, a decade, in the last decade, I should say, anyone who bought property in 2005, 2006, probably had some type of a short sale environment. Um, and that was me, and that affected my credit and my ability to borrow. But if I was looking at that cash value life insurance policy that my dad bought for me, you know, 20 plus years ago, if I still had that policy, I could borrow against that asset irrespective of my credit. Yeah, we, it's interesting because we've dealt with pretty much every situation under, under the sun. Uh, but I, I recall as you, you've been talking uh, about a guy who had several dozen properties. And a lot of them have gone into uh, to short sale. There are several judgments out against him. Uh, he wasn't able to fight one of them the judgment, so there's a garnishment, and he's afraid to have a lot of money in his bank because um, he's had basically withdrawals from his from his bank account because of the judgment. And so he stores all of his money in gold and silver. And he's, you know, this, this story is buying high and having, you know, gold and silver a little bit lower than what it was uh, about, about a year, year and a half ago, and not being able to, to liquidate it fast enough to be able to get a, you know, be a part of a deal. So, so that's the thing is money inside of an insurance policy, even through those tumultuous times, is, is untouchable by creditors. And so you have access to cash regardless of your legal standing. And I think perfect proof of that is you know, a few, few years ago, uh, ago during you know, the dot-com fiasco, the, the Enron scandal is probably what most people refer to when they think about the dot-com crash. And the, the leader of that crew, uh, Kenneth Lay, uh, he's dead now. He died, died in prison. But all of, his, all of his assets were basically liquidated uh, except for his annuities and permanent life insurance. And all of that went completely untouchable by creditors to his spouse once he died. So again, it, not to say that anybody's committing fraud, but it does show you how firm a contract insurance is and how firm access to cash, uh, cash is as well through, through the policy. So you're really underscoring that life insurance can act as an asset protection vehicle because the cash value of that policy is an asset and creditors can't get to that cash value very easily. You got it. Yeah. The important thing also is that there's, you know, we're not tax advisors, you know, so consult your tax advisor, but in our study, there are a lot of tax advantages to life insurance. You know, the one thing that I didn't realize uh, is that the growth inside your life insurance policy so you're getting a profit, right? Your policy grows in value. The cash value grows um, as a result of the dividends paid. And that growth is compounding and it's compounding tax-free that I'm not paying tax on it year over year. And that when my heirs inherit that, there's no income tax there. And then if I set up my estate plan correctly, that they could inherit not only my basis, but all of that profit tax, estate tax free, if I do it correctly. You got it. And, and that's the thing is, yeah, you, you preface this with, you know, not saying that we're tax advisors. If you do go to a tax advisor, they'll, they'll be the first to say that this is not a good idea just because of them, them not understanding it. So that's something that people should be aware of. 
Mm -hmm. Well, here's what's interesting too, is if I take out a loan for investment purposes, the interest on that loan is tax deductible. So if I'm earning money at, let's say 5% inside my policy, and then I borrow that money out, let's say, let's just make it even, let's call it 5%. It seems like a wash because it's going up by 5% inside the policy, but the cost of funds to me to borrow it is 5%. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of moving money from one pocket to the other pocket. The net effect is really zero, but it's not. It's actually better because the interest that I pay on that policy could be a tax deduction in the current year. So I'm earning 5% and I'm paying five, but I get to deduct that 5% on my, as a deduction on my taxes. And so it doesn't really cost me the full 5% to make that payment. Yeah, there's, and when you were using your, you know, your home equity line of credit or you were using your, your credit card for investment purposes back in the, the heyday of, of very liquid credit, there's a section on your tax return on a Schedule A that shows investment interest. It's basically credit interest that was used uh, as part of uh, increasing income through investments. So you're able to write that off similar to uh, the insurance policy loan. But that's another good point, David, because the five and five is a wash only if you carry the loan balance at the equivalent of the cash value balance the entire year. And so our our recommendation and part of the infinite banking concept as, as taught in the in the books that have been written about it is in, in the event of you know a rental property, it's to purchase the rental property and then take the cash flow and pay back the policy loan. It would it would have gone into savings anyway. In the policy, it's just as liquid, but by paying down the policy loan, you have a, a declining loan balance, which means you have a declining interest charge. Mm -hmm. So even though it might be a five and five, you're earning more interest than you're paying if you're utilizing the concept correctly. Yeah, and then this concept of arbitrage is something that I teach a lot, which is borrowing money at a lower interest rate than what you can earn on that money as an investment. And so let me say this another way. If I borrowed money at 4% and I invested at 5%, I'm making a 1% spread on my money. And so what can happen through cash value life insurance is that the earnings inside the policy could be 5%, but then the cost of the money could be 4%. So now I've got my money. I put it into a life policy. It's earning five. I take that money out and it's costing me four. I'm net 1% ahead. Is that possible? Yeah. And right now that's kind of how the, the earnings versus the, uh, the, the loan is working. Is that what's going to be indicative of the future? Um, potentially, potentially not because we all anticipate that interest rates are going to have to go up sometime. And so if that's, if that's the case, the potential earnings for the insurance company is going to go up, which means that the policy loan is going to go up as well. But even if you're, like I said before, if, if, you have, uh, if you're using the banking system correctly and repaying that loan with, with what you've used it for, uh, and even if you have a negative arbitrage, you still make out ahead. And so the compound growth, which means that the growing at you know four to five percent, would outperform paying down on a six to seven percent loan, plus you get the tax benefit behind it. But right now you do have a positive arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of market market uh, dependent. The death benefit is very interesting because the dollar for dollar, you know, a lot of people say uh, buy term insurance and invest the difference, right? Because yep. I dollar for dollar when I pay for cash value insurance. I get a lot lower death benefit than I do when I buy a term insurance. Why is that? Well, first off, I think it's I think it's funny that you know those that proclaim buy term invest the difference because the, the people that we have asked specifically financial advisors that we've come across, um, if 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 they're doing that, if they've gone out and received a quote for a permanent insurance policy and took that dollar amount, bought term and invested the difference, we haven't found one person yet. We're probably up, you know, to 50, 60 people. So it's, it's ironic that you find that advice, whereas the people that are giving it are not practicing it. Uh, but anyway, I mean, the, per, the permanent thing is, um, and, and again, we can go into so so much detail, but it's permanent. It, it means that um, you pay, and whether you die in 10 years, 50 years, or 75 years, it, it's going to pay out. 
Whereas the insurance company being able to, um, you know, predict the probability of a death in te a ten-year term is much is much easier. And so they they basically count on having to pay something out in the future on permanent insurance. Whereas term insurance, the reason why it's so cheap is that nobody dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So people are paying in, and then you know, a few people get the money out. Uh, we talked about asset protection, and that's fantastic. And uh, privacy is a huge part of asset protection. If people don't know you have an asset, they're much less likely to chase after it. For example, if I owned a piece of real estate in my personal name, it'd be fairly easy to do a county record search and find all the property that I own in a particular county. If I had a life insurance policy, how would anyone ever know unless I said I've got a policy with XYZ Mutual Company? How would they know that I had that cash value policy? Yep, and that and that's the other cool thing. I there's there's a client that we have that uh, was was actually his house was raided by the IRS at, at one point. L long story, um, but they went in and tried to find assets <laughs> at his house. That kind of gives you an idea of of how scary the, the IRS is. Um, but anyway, they they went in and and, he, and they said, okay, this is your insurance. Uh, we can't touch that. Yeah. So <clears throat> so even if they did, even if you know, and oftentimes with with a judgment. You're called into court, and under oath, you have to disclose all your assets. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, e even if you disclose that in the in the state that you are in, it, there's some states that do not have the asset protection. Um, but there, there's a way uh, with with insurance companies. Again, this is going to way too much detail, but you can actually get a policy in a different state, uh, and specifically a state that has the asset protection. So, if you live in, let's say, one of the states is um, Massachusetts. So, if you live in Massachusetts, you're not going to have much asset protection. But you can go to Texas, fly to Texas, do your application, and now you have a Texas policy that has 100% asset protection. Nice. And I really, the privacy point relative to the asset protection is so uh, key to me because if someone is deciding to sue me, they're going to go find the easy assets. And if they find there's a, a pot of gold, then the lawsuit's going to move forward. If they can't find the pot of gold, you're never going to get into that creditor examination where they have the ability to ask you, do you have a, a cash value policy? Yep, they'll go into you, you know, then, then they'll pursue your liability insurance and and anything else that it, it's uh, that's liquid. You're right. Yep, yep. So tell me about uh, using cash value life insurance or the infinite banking concept as a teaching tool for your kids. Well, we've uh, we focused a ton on on just the product itself, not necessarily the concept. We consider the concept more important than the product. And again, it would take you know another couple hours to explain the, the concept in detail. Uh, but basically, for using it for for children, and I think a lot of children can benefit from it today, just because of the amount of debt that's going to be saddled on them anyway, from you know the the debt that we're carrying as a country, and also uh, student student loan debt, which is pretty much the only feasible way to pay for tuition these days. Um, so it, it really teaches kids about money from an early age, and and I'm um, y your kids are not old enough, David, but you know have, playing cash flow with my kids or cash flow for kids, it opens them up to a you know just a slew of different ideas and make and connections. Um, whereas they understand transactions, now they can you know realize that there is cash and what creates cash and and how money is made and how money is spent and so forth. So the infinite banking concept it really helps kids from a young age. To have an account that can be theirs, and when they want something, the parents don't have to say no. They can say yes. We can use your your policy, but there are strings attached because as we, you know, as I mentioned in the first presentation that I uh, gave when you were a part of that, David, um, and you forgot to mention that you were pretty vocal about your your disappointment in what I was going to talk about. That's a that's a story for another day, but uh, but but basically, my my point is is that when you when you use this uh, with with children, it, it basically will curb any type of spending habit in the uh, in the future. And so, when they have these transactions, whether it's a bike or uh, a computer, an iPad, or a phone, or a school trip, you don't have to say no. You can basically say yes. We're going to borrow against your your policy, which we've set up for your college or for your future savings, etc. Uh, but there's a string attached to it, and the string is you have to replenish where the money came from. You have to go and do chores, help out around the house, help out with the family business, help out with the investment property, 
um, et cetera, and earn earn money to be able to replenish where the money came from. And so what that does from an early age is just teaches them the way in which money is spent, and uh, and obviously it creates a system so that they can they can follow into the bigger transactions that they're going to make, whether it's tuition, cars, down payments on real estate, et cetera. This was powerful for me because my my son is three. And I bought a, uh, a cash value life insurance policy for his son through Patrick at Paradigm Life. And now I know that my son has access to a credit line that's not Bank of Dad. It's not Bank of America that's going to turn him down because he's only nine, right? When my son is nine years old, he's going to have a credit line that he can draw upon to go start a business, to go buy a bike, to do whatever he wants to do with it. It's not a gift. It's not savings. There's an obligation to pay it back. And uh, that is, I think, a great uh, vehicle on how I plan on using that policy. And one, one other point on that, and this is with my with my kids, the policies I have on my kids, it they're, they're too young to be able to, to use it yet. And so what I've done is I now have a, a little bit different of an initiative where I'm, I recognize the fact that, okay, here's this money. Uh, it's going to grow regardless, but I have this line of credit against it. How can I go out and make that more productive? And I've been able to make a few investments and do some other things with that to be able to bolster up the amount of money that they're going to have once they are able to use it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I learned something putting this presentation together. Patrick was telling me that this asset does not count as part of your net worth when qualifying for financial aid. Why is that so awesome? Well, I mean, like I said before, it's you know, it, good luck paying for tuition out of your pocket unless you know you're going to go to a, you know, community college or you know get a scholarship. And so, if you're going to go to a state institution or a private school, I mean, it's going to cost room and board and tuition, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars plus uh, per per year. And so, a lot of parents are going after you know the money that's being given by the baby boomer generation. Uh, to the school because there's a lot of money available through the school but you have to qualify for it and your assets will disqualify you from it so if you have a bulk of your money in uh, in insurance it's a great way to circumvent uh, the, the qualification you know, the, yeah. the requirements to get uh, federal aid both both through grants and private and and, uh, and public so so if I had a hundred thousand dollars of cash good luck getting uh, financial aid but if I had hundred thousand dollars of cash value life insurance, it's basically the same because I can get that at that hundred thousand dollars of cash whenever I want, but it's not going to uh, count against me when I'm getting my financial aid. Yep, mutual funds count, uh, 401ks, any type of qualified plan, IRAs, Roths, everything counts, bank accounts, etc. Um, but insurance cash value for some reason doesn't. That's nice. It's a nice, uh, nice loophole. So it's simple how to use it. And when I was talking with Patrick, he's so smart and his mind whirs around economics so quickly that it was easy for me to get lost. So I wanted to make it as simple as possible how to use it. You buy the policy and that costs money. That policy creates a cash value over time. Then at some point I can borrow against that cash value and I can invest it and repay the loan and repeat, right? Invest, repay, invest, repay, invest, repay. And over time, my policy is growing in value. So I've got an asset growing inside my policy, which is the dividends and the growth inside the, the policy. Then I also have an asset outside the policy, which is whatever I decide to invest it in. And so I'm getting a, a, a dual benefit. And then eventually, you die. And when you die, there is an additional benefit to uh, to that policy. It's a way for me to provide for my heirs and uh, uh, create peace of mind. You know, I, I get to be a more aggressive investor and a little bit more aggressive of a business person because my wife knows that if I die, she's going to become a gazillionaire overnight because of our uh, the amount of insurance that we we have and that's a great thing right it means i i might be able to have um more complicated assets to manage that uh allows me to be a, a better investor by having insurance yeah and it's li it's liquid throughout the entire cycle that you're using it 
uh, both with being because you can use the cash value from day one, and then upon death, it's the most liquid asset you can have at death. And for those that have had to deal with probate and and estates, I've seen nightmare stories. Everybody dies with life insurance. Uh, in one way or the other, whether they like it or not. It could be a piece of property, it could be a bank account, it could be a car, um, but it's nowhere near as liquid as uh, as the insurance, as the life insurance policy, because that's what, what it, it, its original intent was. Yeah, when I explained to my wife, I was going, if I died, she would inherit a development company that had the ability to produce a lot of cash flow. She had very little, that didn't give her very much comfort at all. It's like, yeah, because the asset is you, not the development company per se. That's it. Yeah. Or even if I said, look, we own land that can be developed. Well, the land is completely liquid. She didn't want that asset. It's cash. How do I get cash so that I can live my life and grieve in peace and establish a new, uh, a new life, what that could be? Um, so the magic trick of cash value insurance is you get to have your money in three places at the same time. This is what made it for me. When I just thought cash value insurance was just, uh, I get I made 5% or 4% dividend and it didn't make sense to me, right? But if I can have my money inside a policy growing, then I can borrow against that policy and go do whatever I want with it. I can go invest it or I can go buy a boat, right? And then at the end of my life, there's a third asset, which is the death benefit. That was just amazing. Three places at once, three assets with $1. And that kind of arbitrage uh, was re really made that cash management strategy make sense for me. Now you have, a, you have a knack for making it simple, David. So we have the opportunity to do some questions and answers. So if our audience uses the chat box to type in your questions. Um, we are going to make sure that you get your questions answered. So go ahead and use that question box, or that chat box to send your, your, your questions over. Um, Patrick, our first question uh, is regarding inflation um, and insurance. So how does inflation impact the use of uh, life insurance? Well, for, that is a great it's a great question um, because inflation is going to impact everything, not just not just insurance. Uh, but I I first started to get this question uh, a couple a couple of years ago, you know, during the QE one. Now we're we're in QE three, and and so I've done a lot of study on on the whole inflation, hyperinflation, and and it's fascinating. Again, we could spend a whole, I could spend a whole meeting talking about uh, inflation, but. Um, first, you have to deal with the probability of inflation. You know, David, you and I were talking about the amount of money that's left our economy. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of money going into our economy because of what the Federal Reserve is doing, uh, but there's a lot of money leaving the economy. There's trillions and trillions of dollars that have left because of bankruptcy, foreclosure, people paying off debt. And right now, the reason why the economy is not getting back on track is because of velocity. People are not uh, getting loans, uh, and they're not going into debt to go spend money. If you go into debt to to buy a piece of real estate, that's not velo that's not the velocity that the Federal Reserve wants. So the velocity is, you know, the uh, one dollar goes into the economy through a loan. It's spent at Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube then takes it, pays their employees. Their employees go take it and go to Walmart. Walmart pays their employees. Those employees go out and go to Burger King. I mean, that that's the that's the money multiplier or the velocity of money. We don't have that right now. So there's a lot of uh, money slide. There's a lot of excess reserves in banks. But unless banks just start going berserk with lending, there's not going to be uh, hyperinflation. Now, there's obviously a huge amount of debt out there by the government and also in student loan debts, and there's a treasury bubble. But you first have that probability. So is inflation going to happen? If it does happen, which I tend to think it's going to eventually happen, um, inflation never lasts, or higher inflation, hyperinflation never lasts for more than a year. You go back to every inflated economy, and it goes up, it spikes, and then it comes right back down within about a year. So at that spike, there's obviously an opportunity to be able to sell off and, and make a really good return on gold, silver, uh, commodities, hard assets, etc. But it's going to go right back, right back down. That's how it's always, always happened. Um, and so you look at just the history of inflation. Uh, it, it, again, the probability um, that it's going to be hyper is, is very slim. But with the insurance policy, again, it's an and asset. 
if it was just an account, it's going to devalue just like a bank account would. It's going to devalue just like a CD would, as well as all the assets with the insurance company. But if you consider it an and asset and you do fear inflation, you understand what to do with your money, you can not only have your money inside your policy growing, you can have it at in these hedged investments. And then once in, uh, hyperinflation happens, bang, you get a super big return on that, on whatever that investment is, and then you have a devalued loan. Because you know, David, you know with, with, a, with a, a loan, uh, a fixed loan from a bank to buy a piece of property, is the payment ever going to change as far as what co comes out of your pocket? No, but it's going to devalue over time okay, because it's a fixed payment. So you have a benefit there for, you know, for, for real estate. Um, so it's kind of the, it's very similar to a policy loan. A policy loan is going to devalue with inflation. So it's if you use it the right way, it's the perfect hedge from inflation. And then if we do have hyperinflation and then it corrects after a year, eighteen months or so, then you have a ton of money in in one of the best assets that is gone through and spanned, you know, the Great Depression before the Great Depression. It, it spanned the First World War, the Great Depression, the Second World War, um, the chaos in the 1970s with high inflation, the chaos of you know, um, you know, the Korean War and the Vietnam War. It 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 paid dividends during the dot com bust. It it survived and paid dividends during the 2008 2009 crash. I mean, it's not going anywhere. The the term we use in in uh in kind of this little circle of people that do this concept is, you know, after um you know, the last thing that's going to be there when the world ends is Twinkies and Twinkies, cockroaches, and life insurance companies. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. As a real estate investor, you know, I would benefit from an inflationary event because I'm using debt and I have real assets. I, I don't think inflation is necessarily you know, what I want, but if it does happen, I'm going to benefit from it. And insurance companies also own fixed assets. So they, they own hard assets. So an insurance company could benefit uh, from an inflationary event as well. And, and their liabilities go down too. So if their death claim liabilities go down because it's it's measured in dollars, you know, it decreases their liability as well. So yeah, yeah it's inflation, whether there's inflation or deflation, the insurance companies are going to do do fine because they've they've made it through both of those types of periods of time throughout the last uh, well over 100 years. So uh, someone asks how to specifically use a cash policy uh, to invest in real estate. And the general concept that I would respond to is uh, when at first, when you're starting out, you don't might not have a lot of cash. So you might be saving a couple thousand dollars a year and there's not a whole lot that you can invest in with that couple thousand bucks. Having your money in a, a cash policy is just a good interim savings plan and that, you know, is potentially outperforming the 0.5% that banks are paying right now. Once you build up a nice cash uh, reserve, that could become your down payment. It could be the money that is just waiting for the next deal, right? Uh, you want to be fully deployed, but a mistake that a lot of investors make is they look at their bank account and they say, I've got X dollars in my bank earning 0.5%. I better go get a deal very, very quickly because I'm only making a half a percent. And then they buy the next deal that they see rather than buying something that fits their investment strategy. Bingo. Yep. So you've got your money in an insurance policy. We all want to make more than 5%, but if the you can just say, hey, I've got 5% for now until I can go buy my policy or go buy my real asset, buy my real investment, that's a great strategy. Also, um, whatever money I need to just have in cash to cover, um, you know, holding tenants security deposits, making sure that I've got money saved up for my property taxes, my annual insurance bill, instead of using an impound account at your lender and you're letting your lender hold your uh, taxes and insurance for the year, maybe you can have no impound account and you pay into your uh, policy loan builds up a cash value when your tax bill comes or your insurance bill comes, you can pay it from your, your line of credit against insurance. And again, as, as Patrick was saying earlier, if that policy loan is paid down, then you're paying less interest. And as you draw it, you pay more interest. And But having that money in your policy is, is earning nonetheless. Yep, and and again, you know, trying to add on to that, you know, it, investors that have gone through the ebb and flow of different markets 
they realize how important having cash is. And again, there is some anxiety, which oftentimes leads to impulsive decisions when it comes to investments. But uh, you don't have to have that anxiety anymore because you're earning a decent a decent rate of return, and you t you tie strings to uh, to the use of the money. So you would buy something that's going to cash flow, which enables you to pay back pay back the loan. But even you know, David, when I was going through, because I had proper, I still have a, a lot of property, but I had more property during you know the the pre pre 2008 and through through the chaos you know I tried to figure out how can I increase my income with these properties I had, I had a lot of cash value I didn't want to buy more property though so I went in and you know improved the bathrooms put new appliances in put a fence up um, I remodeled a, a patio on, on one of the duplexes that I have I mean I, I did a variety of things that helped improve the cash flow and the rent and they were you know four or five six thousand dollar improvements so so again it, it's not just necessarily the, the down payments uh, but it's also, you know, different purchases and, ex and and you know expenses or improvements like that. I really appreciate everyone attending today's event. If you'd like to learn more, uh, you can visit my website, hasslefreecashflowinvesting.com. Download a ton of great free information and other webinars like this one. If you are interested in the infinite banking concept and getting a hold of Patrick. His email is on the screen as well as his website. And Patrick, tell us what kind of free reports about the infinite banking concept are available. Well, yeah, we, we have not just free reports. I mean, we pretty much have everything, almost everything that we have out there for, for free. And so you can visit our, our website, which there's a link right up there. And we have a whole, it's a five-phase uh, curriculum. It's absolutely free, which will basically take you soup to nuts through through our program and answer a lot of the more detailed questions so so on our website there's there's some reports and there's also access to that uh, that free that free curriculum so and it's all video based takes a couple hours to get through but a lot of the details associated with some of the things we presented tonight will, will be available there really grateful to you Patrick for uh, participating in our event today and I uh, appreciate everyone in the audience for giving us your valuable time Thanks for having me, David.